In the name of God, who gives us minds to think and hearts to love and hands to serve. Amen. Well, it is really wonderful to be with all of you here in Bluegrass this morning, and we welcome all of those who are joining us online. I said earlier before we got going, it's, it's odd to uh, be in church and be broadcasting at the same time, but that's been our milieu for over uh, some six months. And this is the first in-person visit I've had as bishop for those six months, and I am uh, blessed to be with you all here in this beautiful part of the diocese. And by live streaming, we're also able to feature uh, some of our parishes around the diocese. So everybody gets to see what a jewel uh, this parish is up in this beautiful part uh, of the diocese. And we'll be doing some traveling around uh, throughout uh, the fall, hopefully, if things stay calm. So we've all been enduring a long season of viral plague and now with summer ending we have devastating forest fires in the west hurricane flooding in the gulf and in some parts of the world even locusts and if this is not apocalyptic enough we are in the midst of a bitter election season filled with rancor and division so it is quite understandable that as christians we might be losing some focus on our discipleship in Jesus' name and find ourselves retreating into us and them thinking. We've been away from in-person Eucharistic fellowship for half a year now. We haven't been really praying and dwelling on the Word of God regularly with each other. I hope you've been doing it on your own, but not regularly with each other. God's Word helps us regain focus. Both of our readings this morning from Jonah and from Matthew's gospel show us the great mercy and love of God. It is a grace that is so radical that if we are really listening and we are really honest, we will find it surprising, unfair, and even somewhat offensive. A few hurricane seasons ago, I stopped on the road, one of my many journeys around the diocese, at a Wendy's for lunch. I had on my clergy shirt and my collar, and it was even one of those, these purple shirts, so I'm sure I seemed really odd, as I often do. And as I was standing there, you know, pumping out some ketchup into one of those little uh, paper cups, a man came up to me and wanted to know if he could ask me a question. And when I said, sure, he asked me very directly, do hurricanes come from the devil or from God? Is it punishment for sin? I don't know what his intention with this question was. I always try to assume the best. It is the same kind of question that gets asked and cruelly injected by some people and some Christians into the aftermath of any large-scale natural disaster. If you Look around the internet and stuff, you'll see lots of this. I paused before answering this man's question. Um, you know, it's not one that could be answered quickly enough so that other customers could also fill up their ketchup cups. <laughs> now, the way my biblical brain works, I immediately thought of Jesus' words, God makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. But there was not enough time for digging into the context of those words. And so I, and I sensed that the man's question wondered or worried about something else. He had no doubt heard, as we all have before, some of the you know, ugly comments that suggest people who die in natural disasters are receiving some kind of divine punishment for various sins. Some have said this is true of people who died from the coronavirus. We even hear the opposite boast. Some Christians claim that God will protect them from the virus because of their faith. They don't need masks. However, they seem to, some of them need guns to protect themselves, but God will protect them from the virus. Now, the first thing I actually said to this man at Wendy's was that hurricanes are certainly not the work of any devil. I wasn't going to get into a theological debate with this guy. There wasn't time, and I didn't want my french fries getting cold. And so I told him that I didn't believe that God would allow some kind of demon to do evil things to us unsuspecting humans. 
After all, what kind of irresponsible God would that be? I told him that everything belongs to God. I was also clear with him that God does not send natural disasters on people. And before he went back to the table with his friends, I said to him uh, that in the midst of our suffering, whatever form it comes in, God responds to all of us, all of us, with compassion, healing, and love. The guy didn't really say much to my comments. He just kind of shrugged skeptically and went back to his table. I don't think any of my responses were what he was looking for. Who knows? Now, it sure would be easier, wouldn't it? And tidier if bad people receive some kind of swift punishment and we good people were conversely always blessed with good things. Self-righteous people, especially self-righteous uh, Christian people sometimes, always desire for God to punish those they disagree with. They prefer a one-dimensional, heavy-handed, judging God. The psalmist is right in proclaiming, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. Sadly, even though we read and we say these words with our lips, when it comes to dealing with others, those we consider bad or different from us in the way they act or opposed to our way of thinking, some of us in our hearts secretly want maybe a God who is quicker to anger and of greater judgment. You can consider the extremely divisive election season that we are in and where there's so much at stake. Sort it all out, God. Bring down fire on those on the other side. Now, we're not alone here. This is what Jonah wants, right? After Jonah reluctantly pronounces God's judgment on the wicked people of Nineveh, Jonah desires for God to follow through, to totally destroy them. But the people of Nineveh repent of their evil ways, and God changes his mind. God has mercy on Nineveh. And then we hear that this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. In the face of Nineveh's repentance and God's compassion, Jonah grumbles. Right? Jonah can't take it. When God changes his mind about destroying those wayward Ninevites, Jonah says to God, this is exactly why I did not want to be your prophet, because I knew you were too gracious and too merciful. I knew you wouldn't give those Ninevite bums what they deserve. In his journey with God, Jonah comes to learn that he has no right to grumble against God's mercy. Now, we can find ourselves in the company of grumblers oh so easily. How can God love and be merciful to people who we find so disagreeable and so undeserving? Now, here you can just insert any group that you find disagreeable. Democrats, Republicans, protesters, non-mask wearers, just you insert your own disagreeable person. Jesus puts a parable of the labors in the vineyard before us primarily to teach us about God's ways, but also to caution us and correct our selfish grumbling. He knows that the parable will bring up a righteous indignation in us, as it did for those who originally heard it and everyone who's heard it since. It's not fair. It can easily roll off of our tongues. When those laborers who worked all day receive the same pay as those who worked only a couple of hours, they grumble against the landowner. Freeloaders should not receive the same goodies as those of us who have been doing all the work. We are doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're on the right side of things, and they are not. And what does this silly and unfair landowner say to those grumblers? Friends. He calls them friends. I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Am I not allowed to do whatever I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious? Because I am generous. Are we envious of God's generosity, 
his love and mercy towards all of his children. See, Jesus wants us to understand that in God's kingdom, people are not valued because they are good and productive or because they make good decisions or belong to the right political party or the right church. God loves each one of us and engages each one of us in our own unique circumstances out of his own huge storehouse of love and compassion. Divine grace is the great equalizer that rips away all of our presumed privilege and puts everyone on equal footing. Praise be to God. Now, we may not be as misguided or as unjust as many people that we find ourselves opposed to in this anxious and frustrating year, but we ought to be cautious in our judgments of others. The grumblers are the ones who sin, really, because they begrudge the landowner his mercy. If we grumble or think it unfair that God, while being gracious and merciful towards us, is also extending that same love and mercy to those that we consider unworthy, then we may very well find ourselves on the outside looking in. We have no right to grumble about God's deep grace and God's patient mercy. Now, we gain access to the good news this morning when we realize, each and every one of us, and we accept that we are not the laborers who have been working hard all day in the vineyard, right? We're all five o'clockers. We're all five o'clockers. And the shocking thing for us to accept is that most of the time, when it comes to the call of our upward discipleship to Christ, we are all idling around, falling short of the kingdom of God. And then, praise be to God, we realize that while we are loafing about, focused narrowly on our own selfish concerns, being five o'clockers, Jesus invites us into the harvest and puts a full day's wage into each one of our needy and outstretched palms. That's the good news, friends. The question for each of us this morning is, what is my response to such radical grace and love? In our baptismal covenant, we promise to strive for justice and peace among all people and to respect the dignity of every human being. We must not be as Christians, as those who follow Jesus, ones who block any of God's children from the good news. More than that, we are to go out and proclaim to everyone we meet God's abundant love for others in our words and in our actions. So may we be about this for the love of God and for the world. Amen.